Shalom Lukulan. Hello, everybody. My name is Paul Gross. I'm a senior fellow here at the Menachem Begin Heritage Center in Jerusalem. Uh, it's my great pleasure to welcome you to uh, the latest in our Zoom series of events for English speakers, both uh, English speakers in Israel and the United States, uh, Britain, Canada, around the world. Um, and um, we are in the midst of a, a very interesting and I think important series uh, post election. Uh, where we're speaking to different guests about um, about the election and the establishment of a new Israeli government, uh, their perspectives, their thoughts on uh, what happened at the election and why, uh, and their uh, hopes or fears for the for the uh, for the coming years. Um, the last two, those of you who attended the last two uh, weeks, uh, we heard from um, uh, Moshe Torpaz uh, from Yeshatid. We heard from. Uh, Rabbi Yosho Pfeffer, who was speaking about the Haredi community and the Haredi parties in the, who are in the uh, coalition, of course. Um, and today we have um, a real uh, pleasure, a real honor of uh, hosting um, one of the, uh, I think, um, real um, institutions of um, uh, conservative commentary, uh, Ruthie Bloom, uh, a columnist for the Jewish News Syndicate and the Jerusalem Post, and a contributor to many other publications, uh, who writes on politics in Israel, and U.S.-Israel relations. Uh, she's the winner of the Louis Rappaport Award for Excellence in Commentary. She's the author of the 2012 book To Hell in a Handbasket, Carter, Obama and the Arab Spring. She's originally from New York and made Aliyah in 1977. And it's a real pleasure to have you with us today, Ruthie. Thank you for having me. Great. So um, as uh, as regulars on this uh, these Zooms will know, uh, the format is I'm going to speak to our guests for about half an hour and then turn it over to you, the audience, to put your questions into the chat, write them in at the bottom of the at the bottom of the screen, um, and I will select some of those questions to put to our guest. So, um, Ruthie, um, you are you you voted for the Likud, that's right. Okay. I did vote for the Likud and I'm a member of Likud. And a member of the Likud, excellent. So and how so this election, and we'll remind uh, we'll remind our audience. Um, was obviously the fifth in the in a very short space of time, yeah. and the, the and really the first of those five, when Netanyahu was able to form a government really of his choosing, he had that one short-lived government with Benny Gantz, um, which was always a very unwieldy um, coalition which collapsed, um, but now he finally has the uh, the right-wing government that he um, I assume wants, and certainly that his voters I think want. Uh, what do you think was different this time around? How did he? Why did he succeed this time, and 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 maybe, and not do so well in previous elections? What was different? Well, I think that uh, what we saw in the first round, uh, which was you know five rounds ago, was that he was also supposed to win hands down. Yeah. And at the last moment, and why I say supposed to was that leading up to the election. Uh, the parties on the right that were listed on the right in terms of polls and on every television broadcast that showed a pie chart of the breakup of the Israeli electorate, um, his camp had a clear victory. And that was because of Vigdor Lieberman's um, Israel Beitenu party was listed on that side of the pie chart. At the last minute, Lieberman said, oh, change my mind, I'm not joining you. And that began this whole mess, all right? And the camps, rather than being sort of more to the right or to the left, and then the Arab parties became the camp of anybody but Bibi, in other words, the anti-Netanyahu camp and the pro-Netanyahu camp, which remained basically even and that's why every time there was an election, it was impossible to form a coalition because many of the parties said, no, I refuse to sit with Netanyahu. And, and, and that's how in the end, uh, Naftali Bennett, who took his votes from the right wing, from his party and decided to, and made a uh, deal with uh, former prime minister Yair Lapid that he that he Bennett would go first in a rotation agreement, and then Lapid would go second, and this is the way uh, Netanyahu could be defeated. And it was a government that the public did not want, um, except the left was willing to accept 
Let's put it that way. And that's how this whole mess happened. In the meantime, what has happened is that the anybody but BB camp proved that it had no platform whatsoever other than hatred, a shared hatred for Netanyahu, and also a shared hatred, and this is, I think, even more important for religious Jews. And the, the behavior of the anybody but Bibi government uh, became so extreme that I think it pushed some um, floating voters or voters who would have voted Likud but stayed home on election day or who were hoping for a change of some kind said, no, no, this has gone too far. The left has gone too far. And that's my interpretation of why this time around there was a clear majority for the right and the uh, religious parties. Okay, um, well, can you give an example of, of how, in what way the previous government put, and what it did to push the religious away from away from the just I'm I'm particularly I'm also asking because for those of the in the audience who were here two weeks ago the the member of Knesset we have from Yeshatid is himself religious so obviously he would disagree with you so I'm I'm interested in I'm, I'm interested in like specifics okay so it is true that uh not all orthodox are the same just the way not all secular Jews are the same nothing is the same sure but and of course there are orthodox Jews in Lapid's party and in every other party. Um, uh, and but we're really talking about the Haredim with the ult, what what's called, I don't like the term, but right. it's what's commonly called ultra orthodox. The yeah. reason I don't like the term is that it's really not descriptive because there are different ultra orthodox uh, um, factions as well. And and right. and there's Ashkenazim and Sfaradim, and there's you know, people are not uniform. There's not a uniform uh, community. Uh, but the overtones, and the, not just undertones, overtones of um, many important figures in, in the coalition that has just finished, ended its term, uh, were openly anti-Semitic. If they had been said in any other country, they would have been considered, rightly so, to be anti-Semitic comments. Um, Lieberman, uh, whom I mentioned earlier, was responsible for the for this whole mess to begin with. Um, you know, went as far as to say that they should all be pushed off. I don't know, in wheelbarrows, taken off in wheelbarrows with the Likud and and violence against um, against Haredim increased as well. Just as it's sort of ironic, just as this was happening in the streets of Brooklyn and Paris. Um, you were having this happen in Jerusalem and Tel Aviv, um, slurs that that would never be accepted. It's one thing, it's bad enough for people to be in their living rooms and making such horrible slurs uh, about Jews or Jews making it about people with side locks. Uh, it's one thing, it's bad enough to be saying that in the privacy of your own home. But to be able to say it um, on video uh, and, you know, in the middle of the street for a woman in Ramat Gan in a playground to say to um, a group of schoolgirls um, in long skirts, uh, what are you doing in our playground? And all you people know how to do is have babies. It's just unthinkable. Even if a woman like that used to would have maybe said that to her girlfriends in the kitchen, to be able to say that in public and know she was being filmed on somebody's iPhone, it's just unthinkable. And I think the public, the Israeli public has always been more conservative than it has been far left. And, you know, when the left goes too far, there's always a backlash in America as well, by the way. Right. Okay, that's very interesting. So, so, so at, at least part of the explanation, in your view, is this: is this is the the, the perception that there was a that there was a anti-religious, even anti-Semitic, in your view, um, uh, sort of attitude within the within the outgoing coalition. Um, so we have this new government now, um, uh, and we'll get to some of the some of the controversies a, a bit later. But the what are your hopes as a as a Likud voter, as a Likud member? Um, you finally have, after a long wait, 
um, this the government that presumably you're you're more or less happy with, um, and you can tell us how whether more or less you're happy with it. Um, but what are your hopes for the policies that you expect hope this government to pursue that you think are particularly needed and particularly important for Israel? Okay, so so far I'm extremely happy. It's early days, of course. Of course. But I'm very happy with the way things are unfolding in such a short time. I mean, ironically, it took almost two full months for this coalition to actually be forged. Netanyahu was having, it, it took him a long time, you know, several weeks to, uh, to sign uh, deals with each of the different coalition members. Uh, but once it was signed, they hit the ground running and each ministry has already made some inroads. So what, I'm hope, what I hope for, uh, of course, first and foremost on my list is the, uh, refor the judicial reform. And that is a platform on which, it's interesting that not only Likud ran, but also the religious parties, they, they even spoke about it, um, you know, in panels on television. And it wasn't even, theoretically, that wasn't an issue that was typical of the, of the uh, Orthodox parties or the religious Zionist party. Um, you know, you'd think they would, they would care more about settlement and um, issues that uh, involving the Palestinians. Nope, everyone was on the same page about judicial reform. And um, right now, as you know, and as most people in the world now know, there are these demonstrations in the streets against that in Israel. Yeah. Um, I think that the numbers are exaggerated and I think that it's disingenuous on their part to say that the, all they're protesting is, you know, pr they're protecting the hallowed Supreme Court. That's nonsense. They're protesting the loss of the election. They're protesting a whole bunch of other stuff. As, uh, as is indicated by their slogans and their signs. And, um, and actually they're just, you know, having one big party of uh, disgruntled, uh, I would call them leftists and outside of Israel, you might call them liberals, but I call them leftists, yes. So sore losers, you're saying essentially. Definitely sore losers, which I understand by the way, I was a sore loser uh, when Bennett uh, formed that government with the left but I didn't take to any streets to protest it. I wrote articles, I discussed this with people. You know, there, when you lose, when your side loses, it's never fun. It's a disappointment. You wanna work to, to make it better the next time for yourself. Uh, this is a different story and I think it's outrageous. Okay, so let's, let's, get, let's get into the judicial reform a little bit. Um, I mean, it's obviously it's come up, it came up in previous weeks. And, and as you say, it's interesting that um, all the parties in the coalition, maybe for different reasons, coming at it from different angles, are, are supporting it. So for the Haredim, I think, and you'll correct me if, if you disagree, um, uh, I think it's largely, or, or at least in part, to do with issues around Haredim serving, serving in the army and the fact that they feel that the Supreme Court has unfairly blocked their um, but, but it blocked the exemption and prevented the exemption from uh, from being uh, carried out. And essentially, they see the Supreme Court, the Haredim see the Supreme Court as a as a a, a secular, anti-religious. I think to pick to maybe to follow up on your earlier point, an anti-religious part of of the Israeli establishment. Is that do you think that's fair? Um, I think they're absolutely right. Um, okay. And if they're if the system, if the branches of government. Um, were separate um, in a proper way, which is what uh, Justice Minister Yariv Levine's plan is to accomplish, it wouldn't matter whether this judge or that judge uh, was anti-religious. That would be irrelevant. The relevance here is the power that the Supreme Court has to overturn decisions made by the legislature, the Knesset, um, whom the public elected. So that's the issue um, and the bias, the whole point is, you know, there is no such thing as a person who's unbiased, including judges and lawyers, of course, they're human. They can't be unbiased. What they can do is try their best to uphold the law and implement the law and discuss it and, and you know, judge it by its merits. The trouble is the way that the, the judges have uh, been appointed as they appoint one another, 
It's an old boys network. It's um, very uh, uh, insulated elite group. Um, and it took uh, much, there was a power grab on the part of the judges. And it was self, they're like self anointed uh, kings or something. That's the issue here. So the Haredim are right that they've been, uh, they've had uh, laws overturned that would have helped them. That's true. But so has everybody. So have I. And um, the point is that the Supreme Court, they, we did not elect them. And we are, we did elect the Knesset. That's the point here. What, what what do you say to the what do you say to the argument that the the, the reforms will will upturn the balance too much in the other direction that they'll be that I think it's nonsense okay it's absolute nonsense that it'll overturn in the other direction those that is propaganda made to you know these slogans it's the end of democracy and 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 and, and then uh, you know the the Knesset will have too much power it's ridiculous. This is about checks and balances and the way that judges are appointed um, and the committee that appoints them. It is perfectly fair and right that these committees should have politicians on them. You know, it's interesting that in America, for example, the carry on about this in America, judges don't appoint themselves. They have to go through, you know, Senate hearings and that, you know, so I, I just find it absolutely ridiculous. And another thing is, Israel has many, um, let's say, the faults that Israel has, if you ask me, I hate it when people say Israel is flawed, what country isn't flawed? What I mean to say is that some people, Israel isn't some people's cup of tea in terms of, um, you know, the way Israelis are very brash and uh, um, straightforward in a way that some people genteel. I don't know what you mean. <laughs> you don't know. <laughs> but one thing Israel has, never been as anti-democratic and it won't be this is this is ridiculous and, and 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 more importantly how will that possibly change the public will if the public doesn't like what happens in the next four years would i hope or four years and not yet another you know um another round of elections well before uh they're due if the public is unhappy with what the Netanyahu-led government does or does not do, it's gonna to go to the ballot box and express that unhappiness in a legitimate democratic way, just as, as happened on November 1st. So the carry-on is insane. Okay, thank that's, that you made your, your points very clearly, thank you. Um, <laughs> I, um, uh, uh, apropos Israeli uh, directness. Um, <laughs> yes. <laughs> so, right. that, so let me ask you this: the uh, as we know, governments in Israel are always coalitions. This government is a right-wing government, but a government made up of different parties. We know that you voted for Likud. You're a member of the Likud. Um, do you have any? Do you have any sympathy at all with criticism of the the religious Zionist party? The people who are concerned about Ben Gvir and the and and being given a and the position he has as, as minister of public security. Or do you think it's all sort of overblown hysteria or do you share any of the concerns? Uh, I share none of those concerns. I am okay. thrilled that Itamar ben Greer is the Minister of National Security. I think that what we've seen with the violence going on, um, inter-Arab and Arab-Jewish and every kind of violence and Jewish and Jewish and on the roads, every kind of violence, uptick in violence, uh, road rage, every kind, uh, theft, that um, that he has decided that what he needs to do to uh, uh, is to have more authority. I think it's absolutely right. And if anybody can put a, I can't say put a stop to it because I, I doubt that, you know, you can't have it live in a fantasy world, but I think if he can curb violence and can, and can make the uh, this uh, southern Israel more livable for all its citizens, including Arabs and Jews, um, that it will he will have accomplished a monumental thing, and so I'm really thrilled with him. Uh, as far as uh, Bezalel Smotrich, finance ministry, I think that's fantastic. He's a serious free market uh, believer in the free market. 
I'm less happy with the idea, although this seems that it's not going to happen, with a rotation agreement that exists in the finance ministry. Because as it was originally, he was going to rotate in the finance ministry with Arie Derry, the head of Shas, right. who was who's just less free market, out, let's say. <laughs> of that, right? Uh, who's who's a socialist. Yeah. And so that was the only that was my caveat to this whole situation. I understood okay. that Netanyahu had to, you know, in order to put this coalition together, he had to make certain deals that might not have been uh, ideal. Uh, but I think that Itamar ben Gvir is in the right position for him. And I think that Smotrich is in the right position for him. I think it's terrific. Okay. All right. You're a happy, a happy customer. Um, so far. So far. So far. So far. Indeed. A lot can happen. Um, so before I go to um, questions from the audience, there's a, I wanted to ask you, as an, as a, as an American Israeli, with your, with your sort of American Israeli hat on, should we say it? Um, and someone who's obviously very much in touch still with American politics and society. Um, how do you see the current state of play with the US-Israel relationship? Because obviously we have, um, there's a lot of potential, it seems to me, for, for tension and disagreement. It could be around Iran, it could be around Judea and Samaria, it could be around all kinds of things that maybe the, the, the controversies around, about, around the, or the alleged controversies around the judicial reforms, I don't know. Um, and on the other hand, you know, uh, so far, it seems to me, and you're, I'm sure you're keeping a closer on this than I am, but it seems to me that the, the administration hasn't really re sort of hasn't really come out in any major way. They haven't listened to sort of the calls of people like Tom Friedman and others mm -hmm. who's, who've said, we, re we want you, President Biden, to come out very loudly and publicly rebuking the Israeli government. And so far, they haven't done that. It seems to me. So is that, do you think that, is that likely to continue? Is that, how do you see that developing with this, with this Israeli government and the current uh, American administration? Well, first of all, keep in mind that America-Israel relations uh, depend very much also on who's in power in America. So of course, if there were a Republican administration um, and a Netanyahu government, it works perfectly well. Um, the current Biden administration, we also saw what happened when Netanyahu was prime minister and Obama was president of the United States. Yep. There was tension. And if anybody knew how to handle it, it was Netanyahu. You really have to hats off to him because that's no easy feat. Um, uh, doing a dance, uh, knowing that he was, for example, his utter opposition to the Iran deal and trying to stop it and Obama being very upset with him and uh, Netanyahu's speech to Congress, et cetera. Having said that, Netanyahu did not fly in Obama's face. He, uh, Obama basically forced him to make, make up with Turkish President Erdogan. Um, and he did it. I mean, Netanyahu knows which battles to pick and which ba battles not to fight. So if since there's still a Democratic administration in Washington, I think it's really a relief to have someone like Netanyahu at the helm, because what we saw when he wasn't in this short period is the tendency on the part of, well, Bennett started to do it and Lapid did it and Gantz when he had been running, they all ran on this ticket of, we will cause America to return to have a bipartisan view of Israel. Of course, this is nonsense because it wasn't Netanyahu's fault that Democrats have increasingly become anti-Israel in America. That had nothing to do with Netanyahu. That had to do with the makeup of the Democratic Party, had to do with the, the especially the far left wing of the Democratic Party. Squad. And I, the squad. And not only the squad, and there's also increasing anti-Semitism in the party. It was kind of shocking to see that I mean, we spent a, um, years saying that Corbyn's Labour Party in Britain was just so openly anti-Semitic. And who would have thought that um, that, that kind of anti-Semitism is creeping into the Democratic Party in Washington? It's just sort of unheard of. Mm. However, and Biden, though he isn't traditionally on the far left of the party, he isn't, okay? Right. And he never was anti-Israel and all that. And right now is senile, so it, it's sort of irrelevant. But Biden takes into account his left-wing flank. 
And, and that's what's a worry. It's not a, Israel-US relations um, do not depend on Israel kowtowing to Washington when Washington is doing something against Israeli interests. It is dependent on whether the administration in Washington um, and how left wing it is. And there are different elements in that administration. Unfortunately, those in charge of the Iran desk are horrible and they are pro-Iran deal. They seem to be so uh, enamored of the mullahs that it's not even funny. But even they, even they are not making uh, headway with the Ayatollahs with this deal. Uh, so, you know, I, I, my feeling is that what we're gonna have to do, and I think even the American military realizes it, is prepare to, to bomb the nuclear facilities and whether Israel has to go it alone or do it with US help is not clear. And the US has elections in another two years. Again, all of this is really in flux, but you still Netanyahu is the best person to be managing this flux. Right. So right, okay. So that's another reason why you're you're happy with this election result because you have a yes, definitely who can handle these situa- this situation. Yes. Okay, great. Okay, let's get to some of the questions we've had. We've already had a bunch come in. Um, so there were a couple of questions about the, uh, I guess, in response to some of your comments about the Haredim. Um, there's one comment, one question from Batia. It's, it's a comment slash question from Batia, who who says that in her view. Uh, Netanyahu's deals with the Haredim have frozen out more mainstream religious Jews. Um, and, and if you could just park that and or attach that to, to Sfi's question about, he, he's, he says that the resentment against the Haredi community stems from the mixing of religion and politics. And is there a possibility in Israel to have a separation of religion and politics? So do you, do you think that that's a possibility? And, and also, how do you respond to this idea that, that more mainstream religious or maybe even sort of modern Orthodox or Dati Lumi are alienated by Netanyahu's um, concessions to the ultra-Orthodox, to the Haredim? Well, since I am neither, and I'm not a member of the uh, uh, national religious, uh, you know, I'm, I'm a secular Jew with, uh, let's say, a great love for my Judaism. Um, yeah. So I, I wouldn't want to argue with someone who is an Orthodox Jew who feels slighted by Netanyahu's deals with the Haredim. Okay. But I will say that in this particular government, where the government is also made up of national religious, we have a prominent place, I don't see that as a problem. Uh, as for the second part of the question about the separation of religion and state, I think, yes, especially people who grew up in America are used to that um, um, real separation. In Israel, there never really was that separation. And that, you know, Ben Gurion really started that, okay? Um, The first prime minister of Israel. And it's, um, and what I would say is the trouble in Israel is that the all, all sectors in the Knesset they're not divided geographically as they are in the United States, for example. So they necessarily are divided by, um, you know, almost identity or sectoral politics. And that is the nature. I think it really is a function of the size of the country where the geographical politics are left to the municipalities, the local electorates. Because the Knesset really is made up of so many, you know, as I say, I don't like to call it identity politics because that sounds like, you know, race and gender and all that. And I didn't really mean that. I meant identity in terms of your religious observance or other other types of identity. Yeah, Israel's made up of sectors in certain ways. Sectors, and it could be your background from Europe or your background from, uh, from other countries. Like there are Russian, you know, uh, yeah. Russian Israelis who feel an affinity towards, Ru- in that sense, identity politics. Yes, and and so I don't know if it can that can ever change, unless unless the electoral system were to totally change here, uh, then maybe you could see that happening. But I and also one other thing I just would like to say that this election showed that even secular people really want to go back to, they want the days of true patriotism for Israel, sovereignty, and a love of Judaism. Um, It's not enough 
for us to have beautiful beaches and gorgeous girls and the best gay bars and the best sushi bars and the best high tech. We care about being a Jewish state. And I think that the results of this election showed that. Okay, thank you. Um, uh, okay, there's, I'll put, there's a couple of questions here that are, that are maybe a little, a little combative, but I'll put them to you anyway. I'm sure I'm, I'm confident you can handle it pretty well. Um, I'm not, but we'll see. <laughs> well, uh, listen, if you don't want to answer, you can say you don't want to answer, that's also okay. Um, uh, so look, um, one of the questions, I guess this is a response to your sort of endorsement of Ben Gavir. The question is basically, how do you feel about him having a picture of, of Baruch Goldstein in his home, which he had until a couple of years ago? Well, I think that's appalling, of course. Um, you know, just when I support someone, that doesn't mean that I think that everything he's done has been great. Hmm. Uh, I was willing to accept his apology for that. Okay. And in my defense, <laughs> I was even willing to accept Mansour Abbas, the head of the Ra'am Arab party, the Muslim Brotherhood party, who got up and said that he has changed his ways and he thinks Israel is here to stay and he wants to be part yeah. of the discussion. I defended him for saying that. I said, okay, let him prove it, okay? And that's the way I feel about Ben Gur. I think that if a Muslim member of the Muslim Brotherhood deserves to be suddenly um, let in to uh, a coalition and also accepted by everybody for saying that, I don't see why a Jewish member of parliament can't be accepted for apologizing. Okay, thank you. That's it. Thank you very much. Um, and Jack Coleman asks about because this is a reference to the I think the very first thing you said talking about the anti-Jewish um, anti-religious anti-Jewish rhetoric from the left he said do you not think that there is that there's this kind of he calls it bile coming out coming from both sides that, that, that there was also a lot of bile said about the left by the right oh you mean the well first of all I would make a distinction uh, between bile aimed at uh, religious Jews and bile aimed at the right in general, okay? Uh, but I don't like bile in general, so let's put it that way. I would prefer to have even screaming fights, but let them be clean. You know, bile is not acceptable. However, to it's one thing to attack the right for its policies. It is quite another to attack, to, to call a Haredi person some kind of dirty, slimy, you know, or like what happened during the pandemic. Uh, they were blamed for spreading the germs everywhere. And when Israeli secular teenagers, it turned out there was a whole outbreak in, uh, in a nice neighborhood in Jerusalem, suddenly silence, silence, they weren't germ spreaders. Now, if you wanna attack the right, the right and left have always attacked each other with great vehemence in Israel and everywhere else, actually. Um, so I would say let's erase the bile. But yes, the right wing, I am uh, a member of the right and I spend, I, I spend a lot of time attacking the left, uh, but not personally, uh, not on a personal level. I attack their ideology and their politics. Okay, okay, thank you. I think we can all agree that less bile is good. Um, Shmuel Yerushalmi asks, do you think that the demonstrations and the protests that you've already mentioned and criticized, do you think that they create any kind of risk to Israeli security or in some way to Israeli society? The demonstrations themselves? Yeah. Or the, um, no, I don't think that, no, I don't think they present a risk to Israeli society. I think that they are, they look like a mass tantrum to me. Um, mm -hmm. And, um, they pose a risk. I'll tell you one thing, uh, any, any demonstration, including in, on my side and including when they come from non-political groups, any demonstration that blocks roads should be banned because, uh, you know, that is a risk. That's a risk to, to be, being unable to ambulances, ambulances and fire, and fire trucks. Yeah. Yes. Yes. I think that's a huge risk and demonstrations that block roads should be forbidden. And I don't care who's demonstrating. Okay. including my own side. No, I think that is horrific. Uh, do demonstrations pose a risk? No, they don't. They're, uh, you know, I, I happen to disagree with these demonstrations. 
And the last time I participated in an actual demonstration, a serious one, was before uh, the disengagement from Gaza. 2005. And that's right, in 2005. And it was a mass demonstration. I can tell you one thing, we certainly didn't get as much coverage as this, as this one is, <laughs> these demonstrations, that Thank I can you. say. Okay, fair <laughs> enough, fair enough. Um, okay, um, so this is a question relating to the judicial reforms. Jonathan asks, in light of Israel's lack of a written constitution, would you support having the supermajority required for changing, changing basic laws and or for overturning a Supreme Court decision? Well, um, I'm not a legal expert, so I'm gonna give you my you know, lay, layman's sure. view of this. Um, I think that for, uh, over, for changing a basic law, you should perhaps have more of a majority. For overturning a Supreme Court, um, a Supreme Court judgment? No, I think that a small majority is sufficient. Which is, and that of course is one of the, that's one of the issues that up for debate. The override, the override. Right, because Levine, because your Eve Levine says 61, which is a, 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 a bare right. majority essentially. And other people are saying you sh it should be larger and that's one of the. Right, but the, re the and, and changing a basic law is a different thing. Okay, yeah. that's already a more, you know, a more fundamental from um, issue. The reason the override clause doesn't seem to me to be problematic at all is that you have to remember you're talking about let's say a law that was passed by a majority of the elected legislature mm. and a disgruntled loser who didn't approve of that law goes to the supreme court to petition the supreme court the supreme court then says uh no sorry guys we decided it's unreasonable an unreasonable law and if then what you only need is a 61 seat majority to say to the Supreme Court, okay, we heard what you said, no thank you. I think that should be sufficient, yes. Okay, um, thank you. So th there's a, a, there were a couple of questions that came up about issues of corruption or accusations of corruption and, and, what, and some Batia, um, who in another point says that there was no one this time around that she felt she could vote for, um, also says, in a question here that she says the biggest turnoff for her um, for the Likud was dirty tricks. For example, bribing MKs from the previous coalition to, to give up their seats and join Netanyahu in exchange for safe seats in the Likud. So that I guess in particular that's Edith Silman, right? Who left who left Bennett's party, which is which was one of the things that brought down the last government, and, and she now has a has a Likud uh, seat. Is that how do you feel about that? Is you is that just sort of how it how it goes, basically? <laughs> well. I would say yes. I would say that the one thing that I don't like about politics, you know, I care. It's funny because people don't believe me when I say that I hate politics because I talk about it so much. It's because I care more about ideology than than uh, I care about politics. I care about laws and things and, and policy. But what I don't like is that internal workings of, you know, the coalitions and all that. Um, for one thing, it didn't, it did Silman didn't take much bribing because she, she, uh, you know, she, her behavior throughout this whole uh, thing was kind of, uh, uh, she opened herself up to that. Let's put it this way. Now, I don't like that kind of behavior either, but it is true that all the parties do it. They, and, and one thing we know for sure is that anybody who's upset with Arya Derry, the head of Shas, if uh, if he had said to Yair Lapid, I'll join you in a coalition, Lapid would have jumped at it. Let's put it this way, politics is a dirty business. And that one is one thing we know, and I'm not trying to defend it, I'm just saying it's the way it is. Um, about corruption, uh, if, if uh, what we're talking about is the accusations that Netanyahu is corrupt, because for example, I, think, I mean, that, um, yeah. that's the elephant in the room to an extent. If you're talking about corruption, I guess that's the elephant in the room. In the I, I assumed. I mean, yeah. that's what I assumed. Yeah. Um, I will say one thing. Whatever criticism people have about Netanyahu, and we know <clears throat> that, you know, lots of people love to hate him and people who support him have criticisms of him, etc. He is not corrupt. Um, and the one thing, <laughs> These, these, uh, the trial that he's undergoing right now, the prosecution case is falling apart every day in court. It just keeps crumbling. 
and every prosecution witness uh, turns out to be more on the side of the defense. Um, and when you, you know, unravel these cases, you realize that the worst that you could say about them, first of all, I think most people don't remember anymore. There are three different cases, you know, and they get all mixed up in people's minds. You know, one is the champagne and cigars and another is the positive coverage in the media in exchange for, um, for um, deals that, that have to do with the big news outlets in Israel. The point is that none of these things would be considered even remotely criminal in another country. Let's start with that. And second of all, the, the, the cases themselves are totally falling apart. So if anyone, if you wanna hate Netanyahu, um, better, better to find a different reason. And my feeling would be you wanna hate Netanyahu because he wants to, I would like to hear somebody say he's against Netanyahu bombing Iran. And then I might say, okay, let's talk about it. Okay, that's what I feel about these discussions about Netanyahu is that they are on such a low level and um, irrelevant to Israel's current situation. In the uh, and just out of interest, while we're talking about sort of politicians in, in like in under the spotlight in this way, what was your view of the dairy situation? Do you think, because I mean, I guess there's two separate questions. There's whether you think it was right for the court to rule as it did and whether in any case, Whatever the court did, whether you personally think that Derry should be should be in in the position in, in a in, as a ministerial position, because in a way I think it's two separate questions. They are two separate questions, and I'm of two minds about one and of uh, one mind about the other. Um, I think this, the court should not have intervened in that whatsoever. I think the, uh, enough people voted for Derry specifically. It wasn't just that they voted for Shah; they wanted him at the head of Shah's. Um, and he was appointed by the government. He was, he's in the coalition. And so I don't think the court should have intervened in that. Now, whether Derry should or should not be in politics and whether the deal he made after he uh, had a tax violation, his most recent one, yeah, yeah. whether that, uh, whether he should have honored it or not. I will say one thing that I, disagree with the court that the law, what I do agree with is that the law specifically states that someone who served in jail cannot serve as a minister. And Derry did not serve in jail for this last tax uh, breach. He was, he had a suspended, suspended sentence. sentence yeah. And the law does not say that. And because in Hebrew though, a suspended sentence and jail time start with the same word, um, that it was open to, you know, some kind of Talmudic, uh, you know, discussion. Okay. Okay. Interesting. Okay, great. Thank you. Um, there's a question here, a couple of questions, which are interesting because they're, they're kind of criticizing, I guess, from the right in a way. So one is, one is about the, the very, very recent news of the, the, um, the, uh, um, expulsion destruction how if you want to be evocative or removing of a, of a unauthorized or illegal settlement that was just established um by the defense minister um gallant um which has been criticized by smart rich and and some others um and one and lib the chair asked the question how do we how to get the defense ministry to listen to ben Gvir regarding the destruction of new jewish settlements that's how she's phrased it but i, I assume that's what she's referring to Yes, well, again, here I would tend to wait a little bit because Netanyahu also made a statement. Right. Um, about, he was actually quite clear. I thought he was actually okay. quite no illegal, clear about it. Illegal right. on either, no illegal Jewish settlement, no illegal Arab settlement. The yeah. second part of his statement is the new part because there has been so much illegal Arab construction going on that it's it's just unbelievable. It's outrageous. Okay, so if he sticks to that, fine. I would say give this a little time. Second of all, I'd like to make a sort of broader point about this specific one. Please. When Netanyahu announced, when Trump was still president, Netanyahu announced that he was going to uh, extend sovereignty to Judea and Samaria um, on the 1st of July. That was, I guess, 
2016 or 17. I, I'm bad at the, the years. Okay. Is yeah. It, a few, um, like, not, yeah. Like a three or, like three or four years. No, that was 2020. Excuse me. 2020. Because right. It was Trump's Abraham, last okay. year. It was he Trump's said, last July, year. Uh, two, right, two, right. July 2020. He said, I will extend sovereignty to Judea and Samaria on July 1st. And then July 1st came and went and he didn't do it. And in the meantime, what he did do was, was uh, engage in the Abraham Accords that got signed in September of right. that year. Right. Now, he, when he initially didn't do it, and he said, because the, I know that my right-wing friends at first went into a tizzy, this is awful, he promised, and now he's not going to do it, and he's not going to do it. So just a minute. And when it turned out that what he did was, he said, you know what? This is more important right now, making peace with the Gulf and um, you know, postponing, postponing sovereignty over Judea and Samaria. I happen to agree with his position. I thought what he was doing was playing chess in a necessary way. Mm -hmm. And uh, so what? I, I, this was all a long answer to bring us back to the specific question about the de demolition, that Ben Gvir and Smotrich's opposition to the demolition of uh, this settlement. I would, I know that they both have a duty to their, their base. And so when they do that, it doesn't bother me. Uh, but I personally feel that you have to give this time because just Netanyahu um, is playing chess and to jump in right away and start attacking him for not being right wing enough. Now, again, I think that they did that. I don't, I think if, if you were to ask Smotrich and Ben Gvir in, in private about this. They they also know this, but they have to they stick have to say what they have to stick to their guns, so to speak, literally and figuratively to their guns. And that's fine. That's their job with their constituents. But Netanyahu's job is a greater job. He's got to put all these pieces together. And so I I'm not quick right now to attack him or praise him for this move. I just want to wait to see what's up. Right. So pa past experience tells you that that he's he has this ability to see the, the bigger picture and he might be. And that's probably or could well be what's happening here as well. That's what I think. That's what I hope. OK, oh. fair enough. Um, so Harry, Harry Schneider, um, he asks it's kind of two questions in one, really. He he says that it's going back to the Haredi point and he says, where will Israel's tax base be? which the Haredim depend on when high-tech businesses um, pull out um, and can't get VC investment due to judicial reform. So there's two, so two questions here. One is, one is and, and for people who don't know, there has been talk from some in the high-tech sector who are concerned, who've, been, who've expressed concern in the, in the form of open letters and things saying that judicial reform or, or percept, even if it's a perception, I guess, of um, a less democratic Israel would affect investment in the high-tech sector. And the second point is this question of, of the Haredim and their dependence on, um, uh, on the non-Haredi public, essentially. And that's, at least that's the, way it's, it's, that's the way it's framed. I'm interested in your views on both of those things. Okay, so I don't know which one to start with. For, okay, let me start with the high-tech sector. Sure. It's not happening, okay? Nobody is going to stop or invest and not invest because of judicial reform in Israel, okay? And the investors invest according to where they can, where they believe they can make a profit or which high tech com Israeli high tech companies they can purchase and uh, take globally. Okay, uh, this is ridiculous. We've heard this so many times before about how Israel will be ice isolated in the international community and in the business community for this and that policy. It is nonsense, okay? And those high tech members were saying, oh, let's all go out and strike. You realize, of course, that they're going downstairs from their nice offices and eating sushi and having it, and then going back to work, okay? And trying to be sold to Google. So I really wouldn't listen to them for one second. As for the second question about, uh, about Haredim, I have said all along, ever since I have been in Israel 45 years, with each passing year and decade, the integration of Haredim in the workforce, in the military, and in every other walk of life has increased, not decreased. 
It is, uh, I think that this is, it's, it's gone from the ground up, not from the top down, the hysteria over the amount of money that Haredim receive. First of all, poor families in Israel receive a lot of help. The Haredim have a lot of children, so the Arabs have a lot of children. Poor people don't pay taxes, even if they're not Haredim, because they don't make enough money to warrant it. All of these things uh, lead me to think that, first of all, I, I do not have that view of Haredim. I have not felt affected in the slightest way. And in, I wanna tell you, with every passing year, there are more, there may be more Haredim born, but there are also more non-kosher restaurants born. There are more stores open on Shabbat born. There are more plays, movies, uh, water parks, name it, open on Shabbat. So I would say, again, everybody calm down. Israel is a work in progress. It's still a young country. Uh, Haredim are not some uniform uh, bubble of uh, like-minded people. And the situation is getting better, not getting worse for anybody who finds religious coercion a problem. And I say that as a secular person. I was going to ask, I think it's a really interesting point you're making because it seems to me that one of the, one of the questions I think that, one of the, one of the um, questions that, that I think many, um, who, especially many who didn't vote for, for, the, for the people in this, for the parties of this coalition, is interesting for them is to what extent are the non-religious voters of this coalition, most of whom I imagine voted Likud, probably some also voted for, for Smotrish Ben Gvir, um, um, how is there a possibility that they may get disillusioned with this coalition if it becomes, to, if it does indeed become too much somehow um, hostage to the to the demands of the of the religious? So I get the question. You know, do you see how do you see that developing? This the the the, the sort of somewhat difficult balance between um, religion and state in Israel and these questions of you yourself said that you're, you yourself are not religious albeit with a lot of respect and reverence for for religious tradition um, but would I assume you uh, you can tell me if I'm wrong I'm making an assumption I assume you wouldn't want to see more um, more shops closed on Shabbat and more sort of a, more more imposition of a re, of a religious lifestyle in secular parts of Israel and things like that. I don't know, but do you see that kind of thing happening anyway, or do you just no? I, I, first of all, first of all, I don't see it happening. Hmm. Um, second of all, I have no problem whatsoever with enabling certain events to segregate women and men. I don't see what the problem there is. Mm -hmm. um, Feminists who want to have their all week, all female weekends, they can do it. I don't see the problem. If there's a, I see, it doesn't mean that I have to do that. Right. I don't see, I see this as a non issue. I think it's perfectly fine to have um, a, to, to, a, an event that, or women and men want to be separated in, in stands or something like that. I don't see a problem. And, and accusing Israel of becoming like Iran is just, it's just, it's not only wrong, it's immoral even to make such a comparison. But, but I will say, I'll just give you a little anecdote to show you how, um, how falsely this stuff is portrayed outside. My own brother asked me, uh, I think maybe just after the election, or I don't remember, he said something similar, like, well, do, what do you feel? They'll, they'll end transportation on Shabbat? And I said, we don't have transport, public transportation on Shabbat. And he said, you don't, I mean, not even in Tel Aviv. And I know we have private right. transportation. We have, right. we have, there is such a thing, but we don't have public, but we don't have it now. And he right. was surprised to hear that because the way it's being portrayed, portrayed is that, okay, now no more transportation, no more shops, no more this, no more this. Also, Netanyahu said, don't forget people, I'm the prime minister and my party has the most seats in right. this coalition. So don't worry about it. And I wouldn't need Netanyahu to tell me not to worry about it. Okay. That's what I'm saying. Okay, great. I, I think it, it actually takes us back to the to the Supreme Court point because and your and what you said earlier about how the, the Haredim have their own issues with the Supreme Court because this question of segregation was something that the Supreme Court in the past 
ruled was was um was illegitimate was not allowed was um separate can never be equal that kind of thing um and others and as you're saying there's you know the argument is well you know if if the, there's no reason why there shouldn't be a small number of events which religious people feel more comfortable going to because they are segregated or because they are you know like a uh, like we have like beaches that are just for for, for re like religious um beaches that are single single sex beaches that kind of thing um I think uh, it's an it's, and anyway, why would why would I care if I don't want to go to a concert with only women or I don't want or I disapprove of an event or organizers um, who want to have it separate? I don't have to go. Right. What is the big? This doesn't affect anybody's life. What it's doing is giving more freedom to a greater amount of people. <laughs> so. Right. It's right. It's interesting. It's a very interesting. Um, yeah. It's, it's, I see what you. Yeah. I. I, I, I mean, said, well, why should a Haredi woman who, according to her own thing, who doesn't want to go to an event with men or men who don't want to hear a woman singing or something like that, why should they not also be able to go out and have a good time? <clears throat> I can right. go to any concert I want. Why can't they also? I, I, I honestly think of it as a totally non issue. Non issue. Okay. Fair enough. So let's let's conclude with this question from Sveberg, who who asks whether there's a concern. I don't know whether he means your you concern or general concern, but concern that Netanyahu's decision making is influenced by his legal difficulties. And it's, th again, there's a nuance here because I think it is separate to the questions to whether you think the his his trial is legitimate. Or not. It is I separate. It's, made it is you've separate. made clear that you don't think it's it's it. The, Correct. The, 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 right. the accusations are, are are founded or fair, and that's fine. But regardless of that, the fact that he is on trial and currently is on trial could could is that a reason for us to be concerned that it could affect no. decision making? Absolutely not. Absolutely okay. not. And I'll I'll give you let's say something that might um, serve as evidence or at least a clue. Okay. During the pandemic. Uh, Netanyahu was, I would say, my main criticism of Netanyahu, interestingly enough, was that he was too stringent on the lockdowns. I mean, I'm uh, more for, I, f I found in general that the world responded a little bit too crazily to the pandemic, and Netanyahu really locked us down a lot, and it was great that he brought in vaccines, et cetera, et cetera. But uh, this was my criticism. Okay. Now, at the time, one of the, the, the rules were very stringent, no synagogues. And if there was a point at which you could pray, we have to be outdoors and um, you know, no families getting together for a Seder on Passover, all of the, the rules that we all know and hopefully have forgotten for good. Repressed, um, I've repressed, repressed. them. <laughs> you know, it's hard to remember that it was very recent, yeah. all of right. this stuff, really, but okay. And the reason, the reason I have to stress that and the airports and the way everything was very, very uh, stringently locked down and the police monitoring everything, the group that was allowed to do anything it wanted was the anti-Netanyahu protests outside of his residence mm. with misogynistic signs against uh, uh, the first lady, Sarah Netanyahu, with vulgar, all kinds of, it was, it really was sort of like Woodstock or something. It was like, we're not just protesting Netanyahu, we're gonna go out and act like we're at the Mardi Gras or something. And they were dancing and eating and doing everything that the rest of the country was not allowed to do. And Netanyahu was asked, why don't you, how it's not, how come we can go to synagogue uh, on the holiday or we can, and we can't go to our families and these people are out there every Saturday night or Friday, whenever it was, you know, partying all night and crowded in together. And Netanyahu said uh, that, he said, the one group that I cannot shut down or ban is this group, because how would that look? They're against me and I'm gonna, I'm gonna silence them. That's their freedom of speech. Okay, so, I find it extremely hard to believe that Netanyahu would dare or would, I mean, even if you're talking about him from an ego point of view, that this whole thing would, was in order to keep him, to keep his legal troubles or, you know, to keep him from going to jail. Yeah. For one thing, let's keep in mind that this trial is going to go on for three years, another three years. So 
even if, if you think about it, the point is whenever this comes to an end, this trial, he, he'll, it'll be after the next election. You understand? So it doesn't even affect him now. And that's why I don't believe it for a second. And I would argue that any politician who's against Netanyahu, who thinks that, might want to think about his own, uh, his own corruption. All right, before before uh, you know, uh, hurling epithets at Netanyahu and accusing him of that. This whole trial, I mean, it's true. Some of us think this whole trial was a farce to begin with to, out, to get him out of office and it didn't work. Okay, so he's back in office. So to say that he wants to reform the judiciary because of that, it's just cynical and wrong. Okay, Ruthie Bloom, thank you very much for your time. Thank you for being uh, forthright in your opinions, which I expected having been as a reader of your, of your Jerusalem Post <laughs> column. Um, much appreciated. Um, people can thank you so much Paul. people people can read can read ruthie in in uh, in the Jerusalem post and the jns as well um so thank you again for your time ruthie thank you everyone for joining us um my email is paul g at begincenter.org.il if you want to be on my mailing list for our english events um we're, we're actually we're resuming this series in in two weeks because next week we have a bit of a break we're doing something else next week which you, which you can see on our website and and also from my from my mailing list um but um, we will be back next week. And uh, I thank everyone for joining. And I thank Ruthie for, for, being, um, for being herself in this. Uh, <laughs> thank you so much. Bye-bye.